I'm delighted that we're facilitating this webinar on such an emotive and challenging topic. Um, before I actually hand you over to Professor Naomi Brooks, let me brief you on the Mentimeter tool that we're going to be using today to launch our polls. Um, using your phone or your tablet, if you'd like to go to menti.com and input the code 440158, and you'll be able to take part in the polls. Um, we'll be allowing about 90 seconds for each poll, and you'll be able to see the results as people vote. Uh, and we'll make sure we share the completed polls um, as part of the recording afterwards, so you can go back and see the completed polls. Um, let's start off with a couple of um, polls to get us going. I'm just going to share my screen here and launch a poll. So it'd be good to, to find out where you are in the world. So if you'd like just to type in where you are. We've got somebody from London at the moment. Um, let's see if we get any other any other takers. As I say, if you go to menti.com, there we go, starting to see people of locations. I'm interested to see that we've got somebody from the Philippines. So, so thank you very much. Um, I just have one other question um, to get you started, which is what your job role is. So it'd be interesting to see um, in relation to this topic, what, well, what is your job role? So if you'd like to, to kind of choose and give us an indication of that, I'll give you another couple of seconds just to get some last responses on that. I'm going to uh, hand you over to Naomi now, um, and she's going to um, kick us off. So Naomi, over to you. Good afternoon, and it's a privilege actually to be here with you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to discuss this very important issue with two really experienced practitioners who organisations are on the journey to eliminating modern slavery from their projects. Modern slavery causes immense human misery, and I don't think I'm trivialising the problem if I say as well immense potential reputational damage. Um, the good news is I think that this is a problem that uh, by adopting the right approaches, by the right policies, procedures and cultures, we can actually do something about. And so the aim of the webinar this afternoon really is to give you an insight to the challenges of eliminating modern slavery from your major projects and to see how two major projects organisations are facing these challenges themselves. It will only be an introduction. We, we have a short amount of time. I hope we stimulate a lot of debate. And I'm certain that any ways in which you want to take this forward, Jonathan, the MPA, and I from the University of Warwick will be very happy to get involved with. Structure of the webinar, then, is that I'm going to talk a little bit about what modern slavery is. Um, I'm then going to hand across to Kate to give a client HS2 experience of uh, trying to achieve that goal. I will then hand across to Alice from Sir Robert McAlpine. And I'll conclude at the end before handing across to questions by thinking a little bit about the personal ethics involved in this and the takeaways that we hope you will have at the end of the session. So the first thing I want to do, though, is actually ask uh, Jonathan to launch the next Mentimeter screen, please, um, with some questions that I think it would be very useful to answer specifically. And Jonathan, I'm actually going to ask you to talk through the responses to that as we gather them in, please. Yeah, happy to do that, Naomi. Let me just share the, there we go. Okay, so it's interesting to see sort of um, seems reasonable confidence that people would recognize a victim of modern slavery. I mean, it's, it's encouraging that there's, there's, there's this confidence. Um, Although, yeah, as we get more responses, it's starting to slip down. About 50% yes, 50% no. Um, yeah, very interesting. 
And I, it would it'd be interesting to relate this to other significant uh, reputational or other strategic risks and see if there was a, a similar kind of correlation in, in uh, how people see that. I'll just give you a, a couple more minutes or a couple more seconds, maybe another 10 or 15 seconds to input your feedback. Um, Excellent. Good. So, Naomi, back to you. Thanks very much indeed for that, um, Jonathan. And I think it, the results of that show that there is a, a great amount of diversity still in understanding what modern slavery is and how it relates to our own major projects that we're trying to deliver. Um, of course, I will start with, with a definition of, of what modern slavery is, and I have taken this definition from um, actually some Public Health England work, which is a paraphrase of the Modern Slavery Act's definition. So basically, modern slavery is the recruitment movement harbouring or receiving of children, women or men through the use of force, coercion, abuse of vulnerability, deception or other means for the purpose of exploitation. Um, and that is a very wide definition. It includes sexual exploitation. It includes forced labour in all sorts of uh, particular um, areas. And very sadly, a large proportion of modern slaves are children. I think what really brings it home is a short video that I want to show you that was produced by the International Labour Organisation, who've been very important in trying to eliminate this practice. And I'm going to ask Jonathan just to spend a minute now sharing that with us to highlight the real issues and the vulnerability that people who are modern slaves find the situations that they are in. Thank you, Jonathan. So modern slavery um, can be found in two ways in our major projects. It can be found directly through our labour flow, through the people that we actually employ on our projects. But it can also be found in terms of our material flow. So it's our supply chain of materials which may themselves have been produced by modern slavery. And uh, modern slavery or the elimination of modern slavery is actually goal 8.7 in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In terms of a prevalence, um, the ILO figures suggest that there are 45 million victims in the world today, with 1.2 million of those in Europe and 13,000 in the UK. But honestly, but given the nature of this phenomenon, though it is very, very difficult to really gauge a, a true size of, of what might be happening. And it's true to say that it is happening globally. And of all the sectors involved in modern slavery, 18% of those modern slaves are working on construction projects, which obviously has a huge ramification for the delivery of major projects that we're talking about today. And it is an issue that is becoming more and more highlighted and is on the agenda of more and more public debate. 
So if we look back to 2015, a survey the ILO did, there was zero level of really awareness on modern slavery and births to concerns. And, and they have seen this rise to at least 25% in 2018, and that's increasing. So it is very much an issue that is huge worldwide and increasing in its impact. A number of um, national legislations have been introduced, and I'll talk particularly about the UK's Modern Slavery Act, because we are, uh, in essence, a UK audience today, um, and, and will be of relevance to a large number of you dialing in. So the Modern Slavery Act was introduced in 2015. It's interesting to relate that to the last slide and see how I think the arrival of this piece of legislation actually has um, signalled a growing awareness of, of what modern slavery is and the impact it has. It's highly likely to apply to your business um, if you're incorporated anywhere, um, not just in the UK. If you're doing business in the UK, providing goods or services, and if you've got a turnover of greater than 36 million, then it is actually going to be relevant to you. If you fall into this category, you should already be publishing an annual statement that comes out no later than six months, furnishing your financial year end. And it's going to outline the nature of your business. It's going to um, show what might be taking place there. And it's got a whole series of problems if you fail to comply. Wordy slide, but the challenges in eliminating modern slavery from major projects are even greater. Projects are temporary organisations. We make a new project organisation each time we encounter a new project, which makes the difficulties of introducing major, uh, eliminating modern slavery even more difficult. We have trans-organisational governance in these projects. So it is not just one organisation, it is many organisations. We are used to having people, we doesn't work for us, working on our sites. And we work in highly competitive industries. The construction sector particularly is really, really um, cost conscious and has to work on very low margins. And all of these mean that modern slavery is far more prevalent in our projects. Um, we have a whole host, though, of ways that we can actually think about eliminating modern slavery. At the centre of that is giving confidence and competence to individuals so that they can recognise modern slavery and know what to do with it. And they have a, a whole um, onion skin of, of, of uh, congruent ways in which we can think about that, both at an organisational level, at a sectoral level, and more widely. And with this framework in mind, what I'd like to do now is hand you across first to Kate and then to Alice to populate that framework and let them tell you what they're doing to eliminate modern slavery. So over to you, Kate. Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kate Wilson. I work for HS2 Limited and I'm the head of HR, Employee Relations and Employment Policy. HS2 is inclusive building experiences of employment. That commitment includes our responsibility for ensuring taxpayers' money does not inadvertently fund criminal activity and to protect any vulnerable worker in our supply chain from exploitation. At HS2, being responsible in business is embedded through our values and behaviours. We are passionate about good employment practices which seek to maximise the social return on taxpayers' investment. My role requires me to work proactively with procurement and other internal stakeholders to support a supply chain that furthers good employment and industrial relations practice. And so because my, I work within the employee relations team, I'm going to concentrate this uh, presentation on labour supply. Through effective collaboration with our joint ventures over modern slavery, human trafficking, employment and industrial relations, our aim is to become an exemplar on good employment practices, setting the standard for existing and future infrastructure projects. The Cabinet Office sets government's commercial policy and standards which define how their arm's length bodies should conduct their commercial activities. HS2 is an arm's length government body. These standards are set out in the government commercial function standards and procurement policy notes. Companies who bid public con have been convicted of, of modern slavery offences under the Modern Slavery Act within the last five years are normally excluded from our procurements. 
to think Demons can reasonable measures to remedy the failures and prevent future reoccurrence for the risk to workers' conditions due to potential poor working practices such as aggressive pricing, short lead times and late payments. We work proactively with our supply chain to reduce the risk by embedding appropriate due diligence. We ask bidders to explain any tenders which appear abnormally low. All our uh, procurement contracts explicit value, social value and delivery will bid against standard metrics. These are used in both contract management and impact reporting by departments. I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to now to do another Mentimeter. So does your contract contracts information include specific clauses related to actions to mitigate against more? Okay. There we go. I, th I think we uh, may have lost sound there for a moment, but um, you can see the results coming in. Again, very much in the middle, which is which is in interesting. Okay. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. So there's a common misconception that human trafficking involves smuggling or requires that the traffic person is is illegal in the country of destination. Within the UK construction industry, that's not necessarily the case. Modern slavery is large hidden crime. Gathering it is difficult. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal industries. In terms of risk, it's high gain, low risk for a criminal entity. Construction has two sides, much like anything else in the world. We create inspirational infrastructure projects involving ever more difficult challenges and the reverse globally. Potential exploitation of millions of vulnerable migrants in terms of body labour, abysmal working conditions and, living, uh, and withholding of passports and limitation of movement. And unless extensive due diligence is undertaken, the model of sourcing acting may make it easy for the plight of the most vulnerable to get lost among the long and complex supply chains. The Dakar principles for mitigation uh, um, mitigation with dignity are a set of human rights based principles and although they were designed by the Institute of Human Rights for migrants they could equally apply all 10 areas to the UK and construction industry. I'm going to concentrate on some key areas. Principle two, we express it at HS2, we explicitly ask that our contractors and their subcontractors provide all workers with written information about their pri employment conditions, and wages prior to entering employment, and they do not charge for being provided with a pay slip. Principle five, we ask that contractors and subcontractors ensure pay board systems are fair and equitable, with implementation as a very minimum living wage, London living wage and UK construction industry national working agreements where the rates, benefits and allow greater. Principle six, both the contractors and subcontractors workforce have the right to freedom of association and bargaining where a union is recognised. We encourage our contractors to recognise po uh, positively the role that trade unions can play in ensuring a high quality project is delivered on time. Principle eight, 
eight, the accommodation, it's clean, safe and meets the need, basic needs of uh, workers. Principle nine, contractors must implement clear dispute resolution procedures, including ACAS co uh, disciplinary procedures in accordance with ACAS codes. We also have measures and requirements to audit these measures. HS2 itself has signed up to the Gangmaster and Labour Abuse Construction Protocol. We also have managed to gain uh, buy-in for our, our lead joint ventures that they also sign up. And as you can see on this uh, slide, many of them have done so. We also ask them to encourage that their tier two and three and four suppliers also, where possible, sign up. And within our new works information, it is a requirement for all tier one contractors that they should sign up. We encourage our supply chain to utilise the gang mass use the together tools, including masters and toolbox tools in several languages, which help highlight the telltale signs of a victim. For 2020, all new contracts state that contractors must include information on modern slavery within their new starter site induction. All, all tier one contractors have voluntarily agreed that they will, if they discover or have reasonable suspicion of any slavery or trafficking, that they will contact the GLA or Modern Slavery Helpline and register the incident on our online incident reporting system. And if modern slavery is taking place collaboratively, we work together to setting out a plan of how and what remedies we need to put in place. Finally, We've developed online training for our staff to complete, which is mandatory for many of our key areas, including commercial and procurement. This training covers how to identify the signs of slavery and human trafficking, what initial steps should be taken if slavery or trafficking is suspected, and how to escalate potential slavery or human trafficking issues to the relevant part uh, parties within the organisation, and also what external help is available, in particular the, G uh, the GLLA and Stronger Together uh, initiatives. We're running a series of awareness uh, measures across the organisation and within our supply chain, including screening of videos, publishing articles to raise awareness of what modern slavery is and what, how to spot it. We're looking to conduct a trial with one of our uh, largest first tier suppliers, which potentially could become a long term approach for other sites and other contractors, which is in addition to any existing processes that they already do for recruitment and also modern slavery. This would include asking all workers to provide evidence of their identity on day one as they enter our sites and asking for proof of address for contracts conditions to be in place even for workers a bank balance in their name the ability to access a phone with credit and a check to ensure that they did not pay fees to obtain work and confirmation that their rate of of their rate of pay if workers cannot provide this evidence then we would be sympathetic but we would and um, would not normally turn them away from our site however we would need to investigate further Thank you. Hi, Jonathan. Can you just uh, forward to my to my first slide, if possible? Yeah. There you go. There we go. I'm going to keep my uh, camera Hold off on. just because I think it might interfere with the um, the connection. But I'll, I'll switch it on when we get to questions. Um, that sounds so very sensible, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Alice Hans. I'm the Head of Ethical and Sustainable Procurement at Sir Robert McAlpine. I'm just going to give people, or will give you uh, attendees, a brief overview of, of who McAlpine is and a, a sort of an overview of our journey to date in regards to how we have responded to the Modern Slavery Act, um, some of the key actions we've done and, and what we've learned from that. So hopefully um, that, that will be helpful. So, in, just in terms of SRM and giving giving everyone a brief um, understanding of who we are, we are a main contractor. We were 150 years old um, last year, and we work across multiple sectors in construction, as it, as it says there. And we have around 2,000 direct employees ourselves. Um, we work on a huge variety of projects, um, including um, ones such as HS2. And we work across England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, we've delivered some iconic buildings in that 150 years, such as Olympic Stadium, Eden Project down in Cornwall. Um, we do work on, um, we did work on the uh, 
support one roof at Wimbledon. And back in 1901, we did the Burnham Viaduct. If any of you are Harry Potter fans, you, you might you might know that. And then we sort of done things like the Glasgow Emirates Arena, and also were uh, part of the, the huge teams that uh, did the Mulberry Harbour docks and the D-Day landing. So we've got a breadth of of experience and work. Um, and with that 150 50 years, our, our motto is building Britain's future heritage. Um, but to ensure we do that um, going forward, we have to make sure those working on our projects and in our supply chain are treated correctly so, and fairly so we can be proud of the projects um, that we build. So I'm just going to, I've got one question here. Um, so Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind going to the to the Mentimeter question, and it's around, um, for those of, um, on the call, you might, you might not like yourselves that um, drive um, um, the, the, the response to um, modern slavery, but who it would be really interesting to understand who in your organization um, leads the response to, to modern slavery. So Jonathan, are you able to, to go to that question? There we go. I'll just enlarge it slightly for myself. And one of the things I find, I have to say, I, I, I sit in procurement, um, but over the past few years, in terms of the, the work that I've done and meeting people within the industry and outside the industry who work in this, it's really interesting to see who who leads it from an organisation. It's not a topic that I think sits neatly in one department, and therefore you meet you meet people across different departments. Um, and I'll touch on it later, but it's key that you bring, even though one person or department needs to lead it, I think it's key that you bring this um, sort of people from lots of dis disciplines and expertise um, together when you're trying to tackle it. So let's have a look. There's quite a lot of in HR, legal procurement, a few, quite a few don't know or others. Um, yeah, interesting. I think we're still going up. There we go. Okay, so HR seems to be outside of the other or don't know. HR seems to be the leading one. Okay, I'll move on to my um, to my next slide. So this is just to give you a bit of a brief overview of SRM and McAlpine's journey in the past few years in regards to how we've tackled labour exploitation. I'll pick out some of the points and elaborate further. But for us, it was very clear from the beginning that we didn't just want to um, go back to that side. Sorry, didn't just want to comply, obviously, with the Modern Slavery Act, but it was about um, about how we could actively respond to it and, and, and have tangible actions. So the initial thing was to try and understand what our baseline was. Um, did we do anything currently in terms of our processes that could help address the issue? And where did we think those, those initial key risks were? And we very crudely, um, Naomi's touched on it before, but we very crudely split our risk into UK labour and, and the material supply chain, the global material supply chain. And our focus to date has heavily been on, on, on our UK uh, labour and sites. Um, and that, that was primarily for two reasons. One, we felt that there was a huge lack, and there still is, I think, lack of awareness that actually modern slavery is an issue in the UK and on construction sites. So there's a big piece around education and actually getting people on board to understand that. And then also our leverage as a as a contractor, as a main contractor, and the responsibility we have for our sites is much greater than when you start to look at the global supply chain. And that obviously doesn't mean that you don't tackle the global supply chain. We, we have to. But in, when we're looking at trying to get initial um, changes and, and address initial kind of issues, our leverage is much greater when we're obviously looking at our sites. So our focus to date has been around that. That's led us to develop some e-learning modules for our people to, to, to upskill them and awareness them, get their awareness greater. We've, we're collaborating with industry um, bodies such as the GLAA construction protocol that Kate mentioned earlier. We, we were one of the sort of initial signatories to that. And then we've also put ourselves through um, verifications such as the um, uh, BES 6002, so the ethical labor sourcing um, verification, because when we go out to our supply chain, you want to be able to show that we've put ourselves under similar scrutiny and, and are looking at our own processes as well. Um, we developed a pilot audit program um, initially, and that only looked at a very small handful of our supply chain, but we quickly decided to extend that, and we have done over the past two years, and over the, years, uh, the past year we've extended that, and we spread that across more of the different trade packages um, and um, and. And we've also started to go down 
um, past the um, past just our tier one. Um, looking at our tier two, so the supply chain of our supply chain, which is, has really focused on um, labour practice audits. Sorry, I think my slides keep jumping. Um, so, so looking at that, there are three key, key sort of action areas um, um, that sort of summarise what we've done to date. They are around audits, it's around education, and it's around collaboration. And I just want to highlight why I think those are particularly useful, especially if you are starting out in this, in this journey. Um, audits, I really believe they, they, at this point in our journey anyway, they have a place, um, but you still need to recognize their limitations as, as with any tool that you use. Um, I don't believe there is one magic tool to, 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 to address this issue. You need, you need an array of, of tools in your box as such. Um, but for us, audits to date have provided a really valuable insight and a different insight into our supply chain that we didn't have before. Um, and as long as you um, they are only a point in time and they can be very managed but so you need to revisit them you need to maintain that engagement but i think as long as you are learning or discovering things they can play a part um we very much approach them as a collaborative piece and you know, we use a third party to carry them out but the majority of the time someone from srm will also be in attendance so hopefully that did, tries to generate a more open and transparent uh, conversation and i share learning with our supply chain and the majority of the feedback that we've had from them has been positive. And supply chain partners often find that it's useful for them in terms of their own processes and how they respond to the modern slavery um, act. Um, and I firmly believe that whatever methods you use, you can't, you shouldn't simply just dictate to your supply chain, but bring them, with, bring them with you on that journey, so they can learn too. And then moving on to that, education. Um, education is key. It empowers people at all points in the supply chain. Um, you know, as I said, there's still a big challenge, I think, to get people to understand that modern slavery is an issue. Um, and therefore, that's where our education started. Um, it's about increasing that awareness. And it doesn't have to simply be to do with the, the workplace. Um, modern slavery is pretty much in all aspects of our lives because it filters pretty much all supply chains out there. Therefore, when you educate people, I, you know, don't simply maybe focus on the work aspects, but bring in other aspects that, of, you know, that they might have in their, their, their lives outside work, because I think that really helps with engagement and it helps increase the awareness. And often it tends to pique people's interest in it as well. And then moving on to collaboration is key. And I, I know collaboration is probably an overused word, but there is a reason for that. Um, it's essential for any lasting, sustained change. Um, and modern slavery isn't simply one company's problem. It's not a McAlpine problem. It's not a, you know, someone else's problem. It's an industry and society issue. Therefore, if we were to only tackle it in isolation or HS2 were only to tackle it, we wouldn't get very far. So, and the reason construction, I think, has been noted as a high-risk industry is essentially you've got to look at our business model and there's a huge reliance on subcontracting. And that leads to the levels of opaqueness in the supply chain that means they can, that can be easily exploited by criminals. Therefore, as an industry, we really need to acknowledge that and own it. Uh, we make money from that, you know, from that business model. Therefore, we need to ensure that what we do is legal and, and ethical. So use industry groups to learn and teach each other. As I said, we're part of the GLA protocol. Um, it is a huge task um, and you can't tackle it all at once. And lots of companies are doing, even in our, in, in our industry, are doing lots of different things. And I, I go to the GLA protocol and I hear um, you know, Mace or Scanscore or Denny's are doing this and, and, and it's different to us. But we all learn off each other and, and that's really useful um, as well. So just moving on to my, to my last slide, and I thought it would be helpful to have maybe some key takeaways. Um, that, that we have learned. Um, I, I've dialed into quite a few webinars over the last few months, and I think it's it's, it's quite. You, sometimes you just want some key key points to take away. So, um, if you are starting from scratch, or you've been doing some things and, and you don't know how to you know, how to reinvigorate what you're doing, um, I would start with you know establish a working group in your business if you haven't already got one, and, and that's what we did. And as I said, you know it will be either you know be someone or a department that leads. Um, that leads that response, but you need aspect, all aspects or a lot of aspects of your business to um, to, to help feed into that and, and bring initiatives together. And then when you form a strategy or even just a list of, of initial action points, 
that will help you get any traction. Um, because to get traction with a strategy, you know, you need to have a you need to have a culture of accountability within your business, and and people need to realise that this this is something that needs doing. And therefore, if you pull people in from all aspects of your business, you will hopefully get that accountability. Um, Join industry initiatives. As I said, the GLA protocol, you will learn so much from this. Um, it might seem a bit overwhelming, um, but it's a really good learning platform. And you will start to understand that people have similar challenges and um, you, you're not on this on your own as such. And then obviously educate people. I mean, I'm obviously starting um, um, speaking from a construction standpoint, but there are multiple free resources out there. You don't have to reinvent them. Or spend money on developing the learning modules. Um, there's, there's, there's the initiative, or there's the organisation, the supply chain sustainability school. Um, it's a majority online learning platform. It's free for any individual or business to join and use, and they have a huge resource of of of, um, of, of um, sort of e-learning modules, toolbox talks, um, papers on on this on many topics, but on this topic as well. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and yeah, look at your supply chain. Um, you know, risk profiling your supply chain. Again, it can seem a huge daunting task, but start just start somewhere and start start very crudely. But just simply look at some highlight, you know, key highlighted areas that you think are at risk, and start with those. And then that will help you sort of formulate your next plan. And with that, um, engage your supply chain. Um, bring them with you on the journey. Um, you know, they will want to learn. Yeah, there, there may be aspects of your supply chain that that obviously aren't compliant, but they don't always know um, that they're not compliant. So bring that that with them on your journey and you will upskill um, the supply chain with you. Um, and that's really important. Um, so that's it. That's the end of my presentation. And I will hand back over um, to Naomi, I think. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Kate, for, I think, an excellent overview from both a client and major contractor perspective. And if we go back to the idea of an onion framework, um, it's amazing. We see that you've talked about all of those levels. You've talked to how about giving the individuals confidence and, and the competence through training, through simple things like phone apps. You've talked all around the ideas of auditing at an organisational yeah. level, risk profiling. Uh, drawing attention to in construction, certainly the really important um, activities that have been going on in terms of the gang masters and labour abuse protocols, and finally the whole kind of systemic nature of the framework that you're sitting in there. What's what's amazing, I think, that those are all pretty simple things we've talked about. Um, they're simple things. They're like audits. They're just tests. They're have you got a mobile phone with some, with 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 which is has got credit on it? These are these are really simple things, but they are multifaceted and multifarious. We've got to do a lot of these simple things at the same time. Um, and I think what's also interesting is that it's easier to start with a labour flow and probably more difficult with a material flow. I would like to just put one last thought to you before we go, because we've been talking about this problem very much in terms of what organisations can do, but I'd argue there's a lot that you as individuals and I as an individual can do as well. I think there's a role for professional membership organisations here that, again, work across this onion skill framework of, of, of activities that we can undertake. I bet that everybody on this phone call, I better not say everybody because there, there, there might well be some who are, but, but the vast majority of us who are in the delivery world of major projects are going to belong to one or other of these professional membership organisations. And they will have their very own codes of conduct. And if modern slavery isn't explicitly dealt with by your organisation, which is, let's face it, it's got to be under the Modern Slavery Act, but, but it's going to be amplified through the own code, your professional code of conduct. And so that there's a very direct way that you as individuals should also be dealing with the issue of modern slavery. But I'm not going to get into the last point which I put there, which is in a battle between professional codes and corporate culture, who wins? Because modern slavery plays to the heart of the argument of a huge range of corporate social responsibility initiatives. 
and a very interesting debate about how we deal with ethics in major projects. So before we hand over to um, Jonathan back again to answer any questions, some final takeaways. And I do apologise to those of you who are missing your lunch whilst listening to this, because there's a lovely picture of fish and chips there. Um, so our takeaways. First of all, eliminating modern slavery from your projects is both an ethical and legal imperative. And you have bought into this just, just by your attendance here at this, this uh, webinar today. Uh -huh. Good practice does exist. I'm being very conscious that when I, I mention the phrase good practice, um, I'm not saying best practice. I'm saying what we see are companies who are doing best endeavours to get there. And after all, doing your best is all that you can do. But very importantly, we can learn from each other's good practice. And I know it's just been a snapshot today, but you've certainly seen what HS2 are doing. You've seen what Sir Robert McAlpine are doing. And through the other routes to learning cross-sectorally, you can take away some, some really good ideas that are easily available. Um, a final point then, eliminating one slavery embodies the challenge of acting ethically, as all of us as professionals need to do in this corporate environment. So with that thought, I am going to conclude my presentation, hand you back to Jonathan, who I believe, Jonathan, you are going to be the host for our questions and answers session. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Let's, let's start off. This is an interesting, interesting first question. Um, I mean, I was, I was struck by uh, corporate fraud, the area of corporate fraud. Um, organizations basically aim to make their organization less appetizing than others. And I think that the, the case of modern slavery, where we want to remove it from the whole supply chain, you need a different approach. So we've got a great question here. Do you think by checking operatives on the gate, this may actually cause modern slavery to be driven underground and those people move to a different site? So I don't know who wants, who would like to, who would like to kick off with that one? I, I don't mind okay. here, Jonathan. Oh. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Sorry, who was... Um... That was Alice. I don't Jonathan, mind, you... um, Alice. providing some thoughts on that, if that's, if that's okay. Think... Okay, you go for it, Alice. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, it's a, it's a really sensitive topic. Um, construction companies need to have checks and balances on their site. But I think when you're when it's about collaboration as well, and what we've changed over the last year, you see more, more companies putting similar checks in place. So it will, it may become the norm. Okay, and those those companies that don't do um, checks, that okay, that could be where 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 criminals channel exploited um, people. But um, when when we're training people and when we're talking to people. We're always telling them you don't have to solve the issue. It's about you often don't have solid evidence either that necessary exploitation is happening, but it's often a feeling something's not just quite right, and therefore it and therefore putting I think checks on the gate. You know, a gate a gate person might think okay, that's something not there doesn't seem quite right. Raise that, talk to people, and and the GLAA will say come and talk to us. You don't have to have solid evidence, but something that you tell us could be the final piece in something, you know, in, in an investigation that I've been looking at for years or, or something they've just started. But I do, I do believe we've got to have checks and balances on our sites, but it's how you go about doing that. And that's in the training of people. And there's got to be sensitivity around there. And it's about sort of educating people and upskilling them so they can pick up on those sensitivities. Very good, very good. Um any of you got any thoughts on that? No, really, just basically agreeing what Alice says there. Um, <laughs> Very good. Very yeah, good. No, no, yeah. Okay. I think I think it's because that um, when we're looking for systemic change, we have to start somewhere, don't we? And I, I think that that point Alice made is is very well made. Actually, that you're not trying to solve everything; you're trying to solve the bit that you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got an interesting challenge here, which is, I guess, is a political issue, but I'd be interested on in your views. Um, the next question, similar to companies committing to activity beyond achieving net zero carbon emissions to actually create an environmental benefit by removing additional carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, could firms and projects commit to a proportion of profits, charity donations or fundraising activities to the benefit of anti-slavery NGOs? Do, do, do you get any sense that there's an appetite for that? Is that realistic? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question and I'll 
sort of throw um, it almost back to the MPA or well, no, not quite because the MPA, um, and I'm just involved in this, have got a fantastic initiative now on sustainability ambassadors. And um, members are electing within themselves um, individuals who will really take on the sustainability challenge. And when you look at modern slavery, it's it's one of the um, UN sustainability development goals, along with all of the other issues that that questioner raises. And so I think that um, we, we are seeing a real emphasis now amongst certainly membership of the Major Projects Association and more widely to tackle these really important issues. The whole conference um, last year at a lovely house just outside London, shame we're not be getting together somewhere like that this year, um, was looking at this really important issue of sustainability. So if the MPA is anything to go by, organisations are taking that very seriously. Very good. Excellent. Um, so we have a question here. As a labour supplier, we have very stringent checks and audits in place. Is this level of checking requirements re replicated across specialist subcontractors, e.g. piling contractors? Kate and Alice, do, do you have any experience of that? Any sense of, 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 um, of how far down the supply chain these kinds of audits and, and checks are, are happening? Yeah, I mean, again, I can I can comment in regards to the work that we've done, and it varies. It, I, I I would say it varies from um, uh, subcontractor to subcontractor, and yes, yeah, some of the specialist subcontractors are, are are doing some of the most stringent checks, um, you know, um, more so than some of the, the labour suppliers. So it does vary, um, and that's one of the huge learning. Um, points that we've come away with um, from our from our audits um, in, in that sense. So I, I, yeah, I know it's perhaps not a simple answer, but it does seem to, it varies across the supply chain. Excellent. Um, and I think all a, I would add to that then there's, oh, sorry, Jonathan, I was just going to say that I okay. think that just emphasised the um, importance of, of sharing across companies, across sectors, and really taking full advantage of any opportunity to do so. Yeah. Uh, hi, yeah. it's, it's Kate from HS2. I, I think one of the key things is as a major um, infrastructure company or, or member of the major projects, you need to make it contractual in your terms and conditions that the, mm -hmm. the contractors are required to assure their uh, supply chain to ensure that there is responsibility taken for right to work checks, for uh, CSS checks, for um, any number of things. People uh, have the qualifications. Um, I think we we it, the the responsibility sits with the the main contractor and the uh, major company, and they need to make sure that there is clear contractual requirements um, necessitating that minimum levels of background checking is undertaken. And certainly they are within our, our contracts within HS2. We have quite explicit requirements. Yeah, very good. You've, you've, you've effectively answered the next question, I think, which is, which is who, who should lead the journey? Um, it was interesting, I think the, the commentator is, is noting that a lot of people who responded suggested they didn't know who was responsible within their organisation. Did you think the same confusion occurs between clients, the government and contractors and, and that there's a blame game going on? I, I don't know whether I've seen a... Uh, sorry, it's Alison. Okay, I'm not sure whether I've seen a blame game, but, I mean, if you look at the Modern Slavery Act 2015 um, and who initially was um, required to report or, or uh, produce a statement and okay it's just a statement um, and you can produce a pretty poor statement and, and still be legally compliant it was you know it was companies with a turnover of over 36 million I think it you know it needs to be everybody in the supply chain and it it, it, it shouldn't just be um, sort of companies and I think the government have released their first their statement this um, this year so everybody has has a part to play in it and um and yeah it, it can't but it, it, our roles are all different in, in if you look at construction in, in 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 the supply chain but we can't simply just pass that risk down through the supply chain 
um, to the next person. It's about owning it um, and addressing it ourselves. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, we have a quite a pointed question here. Um, and I don't know whether you've got examples, but are, are there any examples of consequences of not conforming with the Modern Slavery Act from a legal position? Have you come across any examples? I think well, I think I read a report recently that um, that there hasn't been the, that anyone that is that is is due is sort of has to comply with section fifty four hasn't and, and that hasn't ha there hasn't been um, sort of any consequences of that and, and if they don't comply I, I don't think the consequences are particularly heavy and that's one of the sort of criticisms I think of the of the of the act now it was a great act when it was introduced but. It, it, you know, a lot of thought. There's a lot of sort of discussion around actually how do we, how do we shore it up, how do we, how do we ensure that um, companies are compliant? And I think one one of those things is that actually no one has been held account if they haven't. Um, and there's some stats out there in terms of the percentage of companies that, that have that have to apply that ha that haven't complied with it. So yeah, and the longer that goes on, the the sort of less traction it gets. So it does need addressing. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. mean, to, to follow on there from Alice, there is some academic work um, that shows that as few as 24% of statements issued mm -hmm. in um, construction-related um, sector companies are not compliant. And it's certainly the case, again, from an academic perspective, that the view is that the Modern Slavery Act has not um, necessarily been enacted, enforced, in the way that perhaps we would have hoped. And I think this, this points as well to the fact that you cannot only just uh, consider having a legislative framework, you've got to actually pursue that legislation as well. Now, back to Alice's point though, whether it's a stick or a carrot that's most effective in changing people's behavior is an interesting point. And ultimately uh, a contractual drive from a client is going to be a real imperative that people have to follow. So I think we're in a, a complicated situation where we have we have got legislation which isn't necessarily being used to its best effect, but there are other mechanisms, there are other levers that can be pulled, and we've just got to make sure that we're trying to use all of them. Excellent. Good. Uh, I've got one last question, um, and if you could make it quite brief, because we're almost out of time. So the living wage is an informal benchmark, not a legally enforceable minimal le minimum level, like the national minimum wage. So what, term, what terminology is to be used to assert the requirement around a proper wage if a supply chain is located outside the UK? Have, have, you, have you come across anything, um, either Alice or Kate or, or Naomi? Well, I'm just thinking you need a lawyer to answer that question. I'm not one, and I don't think Alice or Kate are either. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if they're going to be brave enough to embark, I'll let them do so. Well, I get, well, my only thoughts around it are that you you need to look at the sort of individual countries um, as a, as them, as themselves, and, uh, and look at you know look at the what you know things might exist in, in certain countries that can help you you need to be able to like we have in the UK about another living wage there might be similar things in other countries then use those. Um, also, that's when you bring in that's when you start working with NGOs and or initiatives like the ETI the ethical. Um, uh, trading initiative to understand what you should be what should be the baseline um but that's very you've got to start working like sort of almost bottom up i think with those sort of things and, and yeah work with the so ngos or, or, or initiatives like such as eti to, to understand what's appropriate that's where i would start with. Right. very good very good excellent well well thank you thank you all for that that was that was tremendous um and um Thank you to, to Bentley for for hosting this event, which was is which is good. Um, I'm, I'm I'm really grateful, and and I wanted to highlight the next um, big webinar that we have in September, which is part of the series that we're doing with the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. Um, we're going to be looking at leading major projects, and Fiona Spencer, who's head of profession at the IPA, will be talking about. Um, some of their uh, best practice, some of the, um, the, the, the practice that they advocate. And then we have um, Kevin Murphy from OpenReach, um, and we have a senior SRO from the public sector 
who will be offering a, a counter view to that, perhaps, which is really their sense of, of the lived experience. It's all very well to have the theory, but what, what, what's the actual, what's it like on the ground when you're trying to lead major projects? So, so do um, sign up for that. Thank you.